สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program where we study the words of the Buddha, and on Wednesdays we come together and do meditation together. Each Sunday, <clears throat> each Sunday we're learning a chapter in this book, and students are reading this book. And then on Sundays, I share some teachings related to each individual chapter. On Wednesdays, we come together to encourage, support, and motivate each other in our meditation practice by choosing to meditate together. And then after meditation, I open up to any and all questions that you guys might have related to the path to enlightenment. You're welcome to ask questions related to the chapter that we're in this week, or really anything that you'd like, including meditation. Because in order for you to progress to enlightenment, where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, you need to see this as an independent journey that you are independently progressing on this path with the guidance of a teacher. But it's your journey, and this is where you learn to not compare yourself to other people. If you feel like you're behind somebody. Or ahead of somebody, this is just the mind's ego, the conceit, wanting to put yourself below or above others. Instead, just look at it as an independent journey, and you're reaching out to your teacher for guidance through questions, through using resources, through personal guidance, and all the other ways that you might need to involve. Interacting with your teacher to get help. So I'm really pleased that you've decided to be here today for this live meditation. And if you're watching this on the replay, on either the videos or the YouTube or Facebook or the podcast, I'd like to welcome all of you guys and invite you guys to understand a bit about loving kindness meditation while also practicing it. So let me just share something as a reminder for anybody who maybe hasn't. Actually, learned loving kindness meditation with me before. What we're going to be doing is we're going to start out with chanting, and if you've learned those chants, you're welcome to chant along. <clears throat> Then we're going to do breathing mindfulness meditation. Breathing mindfulness meditation is a meditation that I teach <clears throat> that focuses the mind on the breath. <clears throat> Excuse me. It focuses the mind on the breath, and any time that the mind is off the breath, you cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. This is the primary form of meditation that Gautama Buddha taught as a way to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, and arise mindfulness or awareness of mind and concentration, focus, having the singleness of mind to focus on a single object. So we'll just do that for probably like five minutes or so, maybe ten minutes, as we then move into loving kindness meditation. So the breathing mindfulness meditation is there to kind of clear out the mind and prepare it. For loving kindness meditation, then we do this loving kindness meditation where we make these rings and we repeat these affirmations in the mind, starting with "May I be peaceful," and then on the out breath, the next affirmation is "May I be safe," and then you exhale and on, you then inhale, and then on the next out breath, "May I be well." And then the fourth statement is, "May I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes." You do these on the out breath, and essentially, what you're doing is you're kind of rewiring or you're transforming the mind away from anger, hatred, and ill will, this hostility or aggression, this bitterness, even this negative self-talk that sometimes happens in one's own mind is having this negative self-talk directed at this being who you are right now. So by starting with "May I be peaceful, safe, well, and free of discontentedness," you're cultivating this genuine interest in seeing this being who you are now. To be well and to be peaceful, so that would be loving kindness, cultivating the mind to be well and be peaceful, thinking of other beings as being well and peaceful, not being interested to cause harm to others, and then you create these successive rings where you go out further and further and further until you ultimately get to. All beings, and you might have six or eight or more different rings or affirmations, groupings of affirmations, depending on the beings that you're looking to cultivate loving kindness for. Maybe maintaining loving kindness, you might put them in there. Maybe people that you're a bit more neutral about. Maybe people that you have more difficulties having loving kindness towards. You would like to include these beings in your meditation. 
this meditation isn't instantaneous. You're not going to immediately eliminate anger and hatred towards others, but instead gradually over a consistent long-term period of time, you're wearing away even the most difficult roughness or harshness that you have in your mind towards other beings. So that this way, when you're around those beings, you can practice through your intention, speech, and actions to be loving and kind. Even if there's beings that have been in your life in the past that you haven't seen for 5, 10, 20 years, if there's still anger, hatred, and ill will that the mind is holding on to, if there's resentfulness, then the mind isn't going to experience enlightenment. So even people that you're no longer ever going to see ever in your life again, if there's anger, hatred, and ill will, or even these lesser versions of frustration or anger or irritation, annoyance, or any of these other kind of feelings like that, you'd like to wear that away by training the mind in loving kindness meditation, and you may need to include them for a period of time. I often talk about how in my childhood I had a very turbulent relationship with my mother, and it took me a good six months of meditation to wear away the anger that I had from my childhood. But then by doing that, then when I came in contact with her, then my interactions, my intention, speech, and actions transformed. And our relationship transformed gradually over time that by the time of her death, that ultimately I got to a point where there was no difficulties or no problems in our relationships whatsoever. So this is what you would like to work towards is that you're transforming your mind with loving kindness so that now you're, you can then practice loving kindness in daily life through your intention, speech, and actions. This meditation isn't to change other people. This isn't a prayer or hoping that other people will be peaceful, safe, well, or free from discontentedness. Instead, you're kind of rewiring your mind to take this bitterness or this hostility or this anger that you might be harboring for different people in your life or different groups of people, and you're transforming that into just having a genuine interest in seeing them be well and be peaceful. And you use these affirmations in meditation to be able to do that. After I guide you guys in loving kindness meditation, I'll then go back to a little bit of breathing mindfulness meditation and finish up with some chants and then open up to any questions that you guys might have. But before we do loving kindness meditation, let me pause here and see if there's any questions related to how to do loving kindness meditation because it would be really helpful to get any clarification before we actually do the meditation so that it can be much more beneficial for you. So you can put those questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Uh, it does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so I'd like to just invite all of you to join in meditation by taking either a seated, lying, or standing position. These are all ideal for loving kindness meditation. If you're in the seated position, which is typically common for uh, learning in an environment like this, typically you're either on the floor or you're in a chair. You might put a cushion under your rear. You would cross your legs, but not too tight because you'd like the circulation to flow. You might even stack your legs on top of each other or kind of have one in front of the other. This is a way to sit on the floor. If you're on a chair, you might put your feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles. Remember, this isn't about everybody doing it exactly the same. It's about finding what's comfortable for you. The body shouldn't be painful, but it shouldn't be luxurious either. It should be comfortable in the middle. Next, you'd like your hands and your arms to rest comfortably in your lap. So what the Buddha did is he placed his right hand on top of his left with his thumbs together, and then he placed that into his lap. If that's comfortable for you, you can use that. But if any reason that isn't comfortable, you might choose other options, like putting your palms on your thighs, on your knees, maybe your palms up. Some people might even put their arms on the armrest of a chair. Essentially, the lower body and the hands and arms should be completely relaxed. There shouldn't be any muscles engaged in the lower body or the hands and the arms. The upper body, this should be erect. By keeping the upper body erect or straight, this keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. 
If you slouch, this has a tendency to put the mind in a state of complacency. Or if you were real rigid and uptight, the mind is going to be the same way. So you'd like to have the upper body in the middle where it's erect, where it's uh, keeping the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Because what a meditation is, is it's a dedicated, active, purposeful training session where you're actively training the mind. You're not interested in being complacent. You're not interested in being really uptight and rigid, but instead actively training the mind in this dedicated, active, purposeful training session. Once you've got the physical body in a position that's comfortable, then just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here, you're just breathing in gradually through the nose. You're going to exhale gradually through the nose. I'm going to do some chanting in order to ease us into meditation. You're welcome to join. And then I'll be back with some more guidance. Arahang Samma Sammoto Mahakewa Otang Mahakewa Nang Apiwa Te Ami Sawakato Mahakewa Tammo Dhamang Namasami Supatipano Mahakewato Savaka Sankho Sanghang Namami Napmurasa Pakavato Arato Samasa Putasa Napmurasa Pakavato Arato Samasa Putasa Napmurasa Pakavato Arato Samasa Putasa Iti Piso Makawa Arahang Samasa Moto We Cha Cha Ranang Samono Sakato Rokawito Anu Teropurisa Dama Sati Satatawa Manu Sanang Oto Pakawati You should just be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just working on establishing the breath. Breathing in gradually through the nose, taking a nice full inhale, experiencing the full breath. And wherever you get to it, Take a nice, gradual exhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in.
in out. Your breath isn't going to necessarily sync up to the guidance that I'm providing because this is your practice. So wherever you get to the next inhale, <clears throat> just breathe in gradually through the nose, establishing a nice natural breath. The breath shouldn't be hurried, forced, or controlled. Just a nice, natural breath. Breathing in through the nose. And exhaling through the nose. With the breath established, start fixating the mind on the breath. The sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving into the nose. This is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. <clears throat> in out. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you observe that the mind is not on the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. No need to label the thought. No need to analyze it or observe it. No need to judge this thought or try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you observe that the mind is not on the breath, cut it off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in, in, out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work. I'll be back later with guidance on breathing, on loving kindness meditation. Focusing on the breath, just cut off the thoughts and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in, in, out. Breathing in, in, out.
Continuing to breathe in through the nose. And out through the nose. Repeat these affirmations on your next out breath. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles all be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my brothers and sisters be peaceful.
May they be safe. <clears throat> May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May my life partner, boyfriend or girlfriend, friends and associates, all be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May my children and any nieces or nephews be peaceful. May be safe. May they be well.
May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May any animals that I care for or that I see on a daily basis be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all beings, wherever they reside, be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. Now return back 
to breathing mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, Breathing in and out. อาราหังสัมมาสัมมาโตมหาเกวาโอตังมหาเกวันหังอภิวาเตยามิ 
gradually ease your way out of meditation. I would like to just share a few things with you guys as we kind of transition over to questions, is that in the Buddhist teachings, he describes breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation as the two highest amounts of gamma that you could ever generate. And remember, gamma is cause and effect or action and result. This is the results of your decisions. So he describes breathing mindfulness meditation as the highest quality of gamma that you could ever produce in terms of training your mind. And loving kindness meditation is the second highest quality. And the reason why is because these address craving in the mind and the anger. And by you focusing on meditating, and eliminating craving and anger, this is the very best thing that you could ever do for your life, is train the mind to eliminate craving and anger. And then when you're interacting in the world, you're going to be experiencing less discontentedness, and you're going to be experiencing less harm because you're producing less harm by eliminating your craving and anger. Because all unwholesome decisions are made through craving, anger, and ignorance. They're going to produce unwholesome results. So by training the mind and breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation like you just did, the Buddha explains this is the highest quality of gamma that you could ever produce. So if at the end of your meditation you're really experiencing a lot of benefits, this is why. Because you're producing the highest quality of gamma that you could actually produce. And as you're producing this gamma, it's directly improving the condition of your mind, right? Remember, gamma, it's just a word that means the results of your decisions. So the results of your decisions are that you're producing the best results in terms of your reducing and eliminating craving and you're reducing and eliminating anger. So this is what you would like to do on a consistent long-term basis is two to three times a day, for 30 minutes or more doing breathing mindfulness meditation as a standalone if you like 
or do breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness. And you can also just do loving kindness meditation if you like. It's totally up to you. But you would like to build up your practice where you're getting about two or three sessions a day. Gradually, consistently over a long-term period, you'll gradually wear away the craving and anger. And there's other teachings that you need in order to build wisdom and eliminate that ignorance or unknowing of true reality. You wouldn't be able to just meditate your way to enlightenment, for example. You need to also understand things like right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the path to enlightenment. So while you're meditating and you're doing that on a consistent basis throughout your day, you're also practicing all these other steps of the Eightfold Path. So when I talk about your life practice, or you might talk about, you know, you are practicing, your practice isn't just meditation. All too often in the Buddhist world, people feel that their practice is just meditation, But that's not going to get you to enlightenment if all you're doing is meditating. You need to have the understanding of what the Buddha spoke in the suttas and gain that wisdom so that you can understand the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, all the other teachings, eliminating those 10 fetters and how to actually eliminate those so that you can move the mind to enlightenment. So if we just meditated and we went outside and we were harsh and aggressive with people, The mind's not going to be enlightened. So this is why all those other steps are so important that, yes, you're meditating, but you're also practicing that right intention, that right speech, the right action, the right livelihood. And now through all your interactions with other beings, this is where the mind gradually moves closer and closer to that enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So let me open up to any and all questions that you guys may have related to the path to enlightenment. We can talk about anything that you'd like. You can ask questions by putting those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Yes, sir. I see that uh, Tony has his hand raised. Go to him for his question, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just wondering, could you give uh, me instructions on walking meditation? Um, I'm not sure how to how to do that for future. Thank you, sir. Sure. So I have a video that explains walking meditation because it's kind of challenging to teach on an online environment unless somebody was following me around with a camera. But essentially what you would like to do is you'd like to put your hands in front of you, kind of clasp at the wrist or on the sides or behind you. So your hands are just, hands and arms are just relaxing comfortably. And then you put one foot out flat in front of you and then you transfer the weight. And then you put the other foot out flat in front of you and then you transfer the weight. And with your eyes, you're staring at about one meter in front of you. And rather than, uh, you know, looking to the side or looking back or looking really far in front of you, you're just looking one meter in front of you and you walk in a counterclockwise direction, in a circle, just flat, transfer, flat, transfer, flat, transfer. It's almost like a clock, tick, tock, tick, tock. It almost puts the mind in a bit of a trance where it's just fixated on the floor one meter in front of you through your eyes. This trains the mind to be in the present moment rather than being you know, five meters in front of you or 10 meters behind or to the left or to the right. You're just focused right in the middle, one meter in front of you. I suggest that you look at that video that I did walking meditation. If you go to our YouTube page and just search for walking meditation, you can do a little search. Or if you can't find it, just send me a message and I'll send it to you so that you have that link. Because in there, I take about 15 minutes, uh, 18 minutes, and explain to you and actually show you. I had somebody following me around with a a camera at a temple, and uh, this will be able to help you to learn. Where walking meditation is really beneficial, at least what I found, and you may find other situations where it's beneficial, is if the mind is overactive, and the last thing you would like to think about is sit down and meditate because the mind's just running and overactive, 
the walking meditation is really good because you're actually walking and you're doing something with the body rather than just sitting still. And if you're bombarded with thoughts and very overactive, walking meditation is really good for that. Or if the body is painful, like if you're sitting and you feel any pain in the body and you can't get comfortable, walking is really good. Or if you're noticing that you're having a tendency to fall asleep in meditation uh, and you'd like to keep the mind attentive and alert, walking meditation is great for that. So these are the ways that I've used walking meditation uh, and this is how I would suggest doing it. But you're probably going to need some guidance on that. And um, I would suggest, you know, looking at the video. Um, I know you're thinking of coming to Thailand here soon, Tony, and maybe another month and a half, two months. That would be an ideal time to get some help with walking meditation because I can observe you actually doing the walking and uh, ensure that you kind of have this nice pace and this nice tempo to the walking. And if you end up taking that five day class that we were talking about or course, I teach walking meditation in that course. So you'll actually get a chance to learn it and get guidance with it in that course. Thank you very much, sir. You're very welcome. Pleased to help you. Regarding um, walking meditation, sir, does this have to be done in a circle or can this be something, personally, I like to go on nature trails, things like this. Could this be something that could be done just walking along on a nature trail or on a road in, in the city even, sir? Absolutely. Yeah, you can do this on trails. I used to do this in the city and I would do kind of like a two block, you know, forward, two blocks over, two blocks down, kind of like a square. And but I would still walk in a counterclockwise direction. The reason why I walk in a counterclockwise direction is the Dhamma wheel on the top of a Buddha's head is turned in a counterclockwise position direction. So this reminds you of the Dhamma wheel turning in a counterclockwise direction and having the continuous walking like on a nature trail or something like that even though it's not in a, in a circle that's fine but having the continuous walking is what's important sometimes what i see people teaching is where you walk out and then you turn and then you turn and then you walk back and then you turn and turn and walk again what i found with this kind of like stopping and turning and turning is it kind of takes the mind out of the middle it takes it out of that kind of trance like uh, situation where it's just kind of fixated of being in the middle and kind of getting used to being in the present moment um, so by walking either continuously on a trail or in a circle you are able to keep the mind you know fixated one meter in front of you or three feet in front of you for those of you guys on the standard system it's three feet in front of you uh, it keeps the mind really focused in the present moment and you just kind of fixate the eyes on that spot. And then you're not worried or concerned about what's to the left or the right or in the front or the back. You're just looking at that fixated spot. You can still pay attention to the breath a bit if you'd like, but you're just fixating the, the eyes on the ground and get, just getting so intensely focused on that. And then that flat transfer, flat transfer just like a clock tick tock tick tock and it really puts the mind in this middle and the reason why that's important is that as the mind gets used to being in the middle for that 20 30 40 50 minutes however long you're walking it gets used to experiencing what that middle is like and it gets used to that peacefulness and being in the present moment so then in daily life when you observe that the mind's not in the middle you're like ah I, you can see that because you've kind of ingrained the mind you've really trained it and honed it to be in the middle during the walking meditation so that when it's out of the middle you can observe it more readily because you know what the middle feels like you know what the present moment feels like so when it's not there you can observe that much more readily and you can cut that off and bring it back much more readily as well. So that's why it's so important to have that continuous walking rather than those abrupt changes and turning um, where some people will walk out like five meters, 10 meters, turn, turn again, and then walk. Um, and then some people do a lot of talking to themselves while they're meditating in the walking uh, position, which you're, you're trying to get rid of that chatter. You're trying to focus on just through your eyes on the ground in front of you. So 
even though you might start with the flat transfer flat transfer and this is what you'd like to get in the habit of doing with the body eventually you'd like to fade that away where you're not having that chatter in the mind and you're not just replacing the bombardment of thoughts with flat transfer but instead you can control the mind by looking one meter in front of you and then even when any kind of chatter or anything comes into the mind you can cut that off and let it go but more and more you'll get these long gaps of peacefulness and calmness contentedness in the mind as you're walking either in circles or on this continuous walk as you're doing the walking meditation. Yes, thank you, sir. And then also, <clears throat> you've taught that when the mind is being challenged, being around a certain person, when we're experiencing discontentedness, being around a certain person, we really should be putting ourselves into that situation around that person more and more often. Can we use loving kindness meditation in conjunction with doing that when we're focusing on in daily life being around this person? Can we then focus our loving kindness meditation a bit more on this person? Yes, absolutely. So there are situations where, like, for example, as I aged, my mom was living in one place, I was living in another place. When we got together, we talked on the phone, there was this contentious relationship. So I needed to go internal and work on my own mind. And there were times where I didn't talk to my mom for three to five years and I needed to do some work on my own mind before I could interact with her again. Right. So there's that kind of situation where you need to kind of go away from somebody, do the inner work learn how to love without attachment, learn how to love this being as they are and, and cultivate that loving kindness outside of their presence. And that can be really beneficial for you. But then there are situations where it might be a child, your own child, or it might be your life partner that, you know, you guys are living together. There's, you know, you're not going to go away for three, five years like you can with maybe a parent or a sibling or something like this. So in that situation, you still would like to do that inner work because if you're annoyed or you're frustrated around certain people, this is you causing it yourself. So you need to do that inner work. And it's breathing mindfulness meditation to let go of the cravings, but the loving kindness meditation to let go of the hostility and the bitterness or any kind of anger, hatred, ill will towards this being. So you can be doing that work and say your life partner you're still with that life partner and it's not going to be immediate. You know, it's not going to be one month. It's not going to be two months, probably depending on how much of the anger that you have and depending on whether it's ongoing anger or whether it's anger from the past. So you need to do that work with the loving kindness meditation consistently on an ongoing basis and realize it's going to be a gradual progression. And <clears throat> remember that the whole reason why the mind's angry to begin with is because of craving. So it's important that you, you know, have the breathing mindfulness meditation consistently going so that you are able to eliminate the craving and practicing generosity, the giving and sharing. This is really important to train the mind to let go. That's going to knock down the craving. And then with the loving kindness meditation and cultivating loving kindness and meditation, and then when you're around your life partner or you're around your children, you're around your siblings or your parents or whoever it is, now dig in deep and practice through your intention, speech and actions to have this genuine interest in seeing them be well and using all the aspects of the Eightfold Path that the Buddha teaches. Because remember, right intention is three aspects, renunciation, non-ill will and harmlessness. And then remember, right speech has things like, you know, eliminating lying or slander or harsh speech, uh, things like this. But then also look at the five factors of well-spoken speech, even though that's not a part of the core path of the Eightfold Path, it is part of the path to enlightenment. It's just kind of a, a teaching that gets plugged into the Eightfold Path. So be sure that when you're interacting, that you're interacting with a mind of loving kindness with 
your parents or with your life partner or with your children and realize you're going to mess up sometimes. Realize that it's a practice, that you're going to feel like you're doing well at certain times and you've got this nailed down. And then there's going to be other times where you trip up and you mess up and you speak harsh or you get angry at them or you even yell at them maybe. So realize that that's part of it. And rather than beat yourself up about it, just realize that, okay, I was wrong in that situation. I need to improve. Let me apologize. Even if they were yelling at you too, you know, apologize if you need to and just continue to work on it and bring your practice up more and more to the ideal of where you're always interacting with all beings with loving kindness through your intention, speech, and actions. Yes. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. It does not appear we have any other questions at this time, sir. All right. Well, I would like to thank all of you guys for joining the class and being so consistent with participating in class and asking questions and meditating. This is going to help you. You know, it's kind of strange that your teacher's thanking you, right? The reason why I'm thanking you and the reason why I thank students all the time is because you're making the world a better place. That's why I'm thanking you, because my interest is for this world to be like heaven on earth and for you to learn and practice these teachings. It's helping you. It's helping those close to you and it's helping all of humanity. This is why I say thank you to students for learning and practicing these teachings, because you're helping to improve humanity through you training your mind and now causing less and less harm in the world. So thank you all for your dedication and your diligence to learning and practicing these teachings. This Sunday in the group learning program, we're going to be in chapter 19, which is titled The Difficult Human Existence, Sickness, Aging, and Death. This is where I'm going to share with you some of Gautama Buddha's life story, but then I'm going to go into sickness, aging, and death because these tend to be the hardest, most challenging things for individuals to deal with during life is that the mind is typically highly discontent based on sickness, based on aging, and based on death. So I'm going to help you to understand these through how the Buddha understood them in terms of motivators to help him get to enlightenment. But also I'm going to help you understand them in terms of how you can look at them differently and train the mind to be peaceful and calm while you're experiencing these things. So on Sunday, we'll be doing that in our group learning program. And then next Wednesday, we'll be doing the breathing mindfulness meditation where you can come together to encourage, support, and motivate each other with breathing mindfulness meditation and ask any questions that you like related to these teachings. And then, of course, on Saturdays, each Saturday, we do our Pali Canon in English study group. So you're welcome to join that at any time. So I'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. Take care. Sawadee again for watching enjoy your meditation look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have thank you so much